In just the first two weeks of 2026, China has delivered a series of breakthroughs that caught the global scientific community off guard. These weren't press releases or distant roadmaps, but verified results that pushed past limits many believed were still firmly in place. Within days, Chinese researchers demonstrated transistors operating beyond the one nanometer scale without silicon, unveiled AI hardware capable of reaching around 500 billion operations per second while running core computations nearly four times faster at lower power, and successfully sustained the world's first high-density fusion plasma beyond accepted limits inside its artificial sun. For more than half a century, the entire electronics world has been built on silicon. Every smartphone, laptop, server, and AI accelerator owes its existence to the steady shrinking of silicon transistors. But that progress is now slowing for a simple reason. Physics. As transistors approach atomic dimensions, silicon starts to lose control over electrical current leakage increases, power efficiency collapses, and reliability becomes harder to guarantee. For years, researchers have warned that silicon is running out of road. What has been missing is a real, working alternative at the same scale modern chips require. And finally, what researchers in China have just shown is one of the clearest signs yet that something beyond silicon is finally becoming real. Researchers at Nanjing University have demonstrated ultra-small, high-performance transistors built directly on a two-dimensional semiconductor. The work was published in Nature Electronics, and it tackles the single hardest problem that has held 2D electronics back for more than a decade, making reliable electrical contacts at extremely small sizes at and even beyond the one nanometer technology node. The material at the center of the breakthrough is molybdenum disulfide, often called MoS2. Unlike silicon, which is three-dimensional, MoS2 can exist as a sheet just one atom thick. This extreme thinness gives it a major advantage. When transistors shrink, silicon struggles to keep current under control, leading to short channel effects and leakage. Atomically thin materials naturally avoid many of these problems. In theory, they can scale far beyond silicon, but in practice, almost every attempt has failed. The reason is not the transistor channel itself, but the contacts. A transistor needs metal contacts to inject and collect current. As devices shrink to the nanometer scale, those contacts must also shrink. For 2D semiconductors, this has been a nightmare. Traditional methods of depositing metal contacts create rough, imperfect interfaces. Electrical resistance skyrockets as the contact length decreases, destroying performance. Even if the transistor channel works perfectly, poor contacts make the device unusable. This contact problem has quietly been the wall no one could break through, not just in China, but globally. Western universities and major semiconductor companies have faced the same limitation. Many promising 2D transistor concepts stalled not because the material failed, but because the electrical connections could not scale with it. The Nanjing University team approached it from a completely different direction. Instead of placing metal contacts on top of the semiconductor, they grew the contacts directly on the 2D material itself. Using a technique called molecular beam epitaxy, or MBE, they deposited atoms of antimony onto a single layer of MOS2 in an ultra-high vacuum environment. MBE allows atoms to be added one by one, slowly and precisely, giving them time to arrange themselves into a stable crystal structure. Because of this controlled growth, the antimony atoms naturally formed a highly ordered crystal that bonded intimately with the MOS2 layer. The result was a clean, nearly perfect interface between the metal contact and the semiconductor, something that conventional deposition methods struggle to achieve. This small change in how contacts are formed led to a massive improvement in performance. The researchers found that the antimony contacts maintained ultra-low electrical resistance even when shrunk to 18 nanometers. That is an extraordinary result. In previous 2D transistor designs, contact resistance often began degrading at lengths of 60 nanometers or more. The team measured a transfer length of around 13 nanometers, which is the critical requirement for the industry's future one nanometer technology node. To date, no other 2D semiconductor contact technology has convincingly met this threshold. This is why the work stands out. For years, research on 2D transistors focused mainly on shrinking the channel, while contacts were treated as a secondary problem. This study shows the opposite. 
Contacts are the real limiter. Once they are solved, 2D semiconductors suddenly become viable at dimensions where silicon struggles or fails outright. Using this approach, the researchers demonstrated what may be the smallest high-performance 2D transistor ever built, with a contacted gate pitch below 40 nanometers. That places these devices directly in the range targeted by future commercial chip roadmaps, not some distant experimental regime. This result also aligns closely with where the semiconductor industry believes things are heading. In 2025, IMEC, one of the world's most influential semiconductor research organizations, publicly stated that 2D semiconductors represent the final option for transistor scaling once silicon reaches its limit. Until now, that statement was largely based on theory and small-scale demonstrations. This work provides rare, concrete experimental proof that such scaling is actually achievable. What makes this especially significant is where this breakthrough is coming from. At a time when advanced silicon manufacturing is tightly controlled by a handful of countries and companies, China has been aggressively investing in alternative paths forward. Instead of competing head-to-head -head on the most advanced silicon nodes alone, Chinese research institutions are exploring materials and device architectures that could bypass some of the existing technological choke points altogether. This work fits squarely into that strategy. The silicon era is not over yet, but it is now clear that transistors smaller than silicon allows are not only possible, they already work. Another breakthrough from China in 2026 is a solid and realistic advance in AI-oriented computing. Researchers from Peking University have demonstrated a new computing architecture capable of reaching around 500 billion operations per second for a specific class of workloads, roughly four times faster than their earlier system, while also consuming less power. The key point is that this architecture is not a general-purpose AI processor like today's GPUs. It is optimized around one core mathematical operation, the Fourier transform. Fourier transforms are used constantly in modern technology, from image and video processing to radar systems, wireless communication, medical imaging, and many perception-related AI tasks. However, traditional digital chips handle these operations inefficiently because they rely on moving large amounts of data back and forth between memory and logic units, which cost time and energy. The Chinese researchers approach the problem differently. Instead of forcing all computation into standard digital logic, they built a multi-physics computing architecture. In simple terms, different parts of the computation run in different physical forms, such as electrical current, stored charge, or optical signals, depending on what is most efficient for that step. This reduces unnecessary data movement and allows certain calculations to happen more naturally at the physical level rather than being simulated digitally. This is where the speed and energy gains come from. By tailoring the hardware specifically for Fourier-based operations, the system can jump from about 130 billion operations per second to nearly 500 billion without a corresponding increase in power consumption. That kind of efficiency improvement is difficult to achieve on conventional processors, even highly advanced ones. For comparison, companies like NVIDIA and Google dominate today's AI landscape with GPUs and TPUs. These chips are incredibly powerful and flexible, capable of running everything from large language models to physics simulations. But that flexibility comes at the cost of energy use and heat, especially as AI workloads continue to scale. Even NVIDIA and Google are now exploring more specialized accelerators to offload specific tasks. In that sense, the Peking University work fits into a broader global trend rather than standing apart from it. Similar ideas are being explored in neuromorphic computing, photonic computing, and in-memory processing by research teams and companies worldwide, including IBM. The shared goal is not to replace GPUs entirely, but to complement them with hardware that excels at very specific mathematical operations. And the pattern does not stop at electronics or AI hardware. In 2026, China's nuclear fusion program has crossed a milestone that fusion scientists have been trying to reach for decades. At the Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak, better known as EAST or China's Artificial Sun, researchers have experimentally exceeded the green wall limit for the first time in a realistic, fusion-capable plasma. This is not a simulation or a low-power test. It was achieved under conditions relevant to future power-producing reactors. 
To understand why this matters, it helps to look at the core problem of fusion. Fusion reactors work by heating hydrogen plasma to extreme temperatures so atomic nuclei can collide and fuse, releasing energy. On Earth, this requires temperatures above 100 million degrees Celsius, far hotter than the sun, because we cannot recreate the sun's immense gravitational pressure. In tokamak reactors, the plasma is confined by powerful magnetic fields inside a donut-shaped chamber. For decades, fusion research has been constrained by an empirical rule called the Greenwald Limit. This limit sets a maximum plasma density beyond which the plasma becomes unstable and collapses. Higher density is desirable because it directly increases the fusion reaction rate. But pushing density too far traditionally causes turbulence and disruptions that shut the reactor down. As a result, most tokamaks operate conservatively at about 80 to 100 percent of the Greenwald Limit. EAST has now shown that this ceiling is not absolute. By carefully adjusting initial plasma conditions, including gas pressure and how electrons absorb microwave heating, the EAST team managed to sustain plasma densities between 1.3 and 1.65 times the Greenwald limit without triggering instability. This places the experiment in a new operational regime that had previously existed only in theory. Importantly, these conditions were achieved while maintaining temperatures and magnetic fields relevant to real fusion reactors, not low-energy laboratory setups. This achievement builds on EAST's earlier record-breaking performance. In previous experiments, the reactor sustained ultra-hot plasma above 100 million degrees Celsius for 1,066 seconds, or nearly 18 minutes, setting a global benchmark for steady-state fusion operation. The new density result adds another critical piece to the puzzle. Not just how long fusion plasma can be held, but how intensely it can be packed while remaining stable. According to the findings, the results suggest a practical and scalable way to extend density limits in future tokamaks, including next-generation burning plasma reactors. Burning plasma refers to conditions where the fusion reactions themselves provide most of the heating a requirement for any viable fusion power plant. It's worth noting that the Greenwald limit has been exceeded before, but only under conditions that were not useful for fusion energy. Earlier experiments managed much higher densities, but at low temperatures and weak magnetic fields where fusion cannot occur. EAST's result is the first to demonstrate sustained operation beyond the limit in a fusion-relevant regime. Globally, this puts China in a strong position in the fusion race. Projects like ITER are designed around conservative operating assumptions that respect traditional density limits. Results like this suggest that future reactors may be able to run at higher performance than previously planned, potentially reducing size, cost, or time to net energy gain. So what do you think? Has China already started beating the West in the technologies that decide the next decade? Comment your take, and if you want the real story behind the world's fastest moving AI and tech breakthroughs, make sure to like and subscribe to Evolving AI for daily coverage.